Russian submarine fleets are always a mystery and almost a surprise in the world's seas. It is unclear where they will come from. So do we know where they were last seen? And the reason behind Putin's risky submarine gambling in the world's seas? Vladimir Putin continues to take a risky gamble, both in Eastern Europe and in the seas of the world. Putin, who took the biggest gamble of his political career by starting the Ukraine war, is losing this gamble heavily. Putin's three losing political identities and the drastic decline in the level of deterrence of the Russian army caused the Kremlin to make urgent action plans. The Russian Navy, which has been in dangerous elbow contact with different countries since the first day of the war, has again made a dangerous move. There was talk on the Pentagon side that the deployment of desperately advancing Russian nuclear submarines to U.S. shores could threaten American security. The U.S. Navy is on alert about the activities of Russia's submarine fleet, possibly consisting of three to six pieces. Thousands of miles off the U.S. coast, U.S. Navy commanders have expressed concern that emerging patterns of deploying fleets of Russian nuclear submarines on U.S. coasts could threaten American security. This situation was also an indicator of a new crisis, the incessant spread of U.S. aid to Ukraine and the helplessness of the Russian army in the face of powerful U.S. weapons may have prompted Putin to make such a move. We all know that the activities of the Russian Navy cannot go beyond threats, even though it seems clear that Putin, who does not hesitate to threaten the West at every stage of the war, wants to create new threat with this elbow contact. Russian submarines were also seen more frequently in the Mediterranean and near the U.S. coast, according to officials. This, along with Russia's preoccupation with the Ukraine war and the subsequent buildup of Russian forces and nuclear submarines in the Black Sea is also increasing the temperature of the waters off the U.S. coast, the Baltics and the Arctic. The Russian Institute for Maritime Studies reports that there are indications that Russian nuclear-powered submarines have been deployed off the coast of the United States, in the Mediterranean, and elsewhere in Europe. It resembles the Soviet-style submarine tactics of the Russian Navy's deployments during the Cold War. Putin said his country would build more nuclear-powered submarines, quote, assuring Russia's security for decades. According to military experts, the exact scale of Russian nuclear submarine deployment remains unclear, but it has certainly seen a massive increase over the past two decades. In January of this year, the Russian Navy launched the Belgorod, the world's largest and most dangerous submarine equipped with Poseidon torpedoes, held as superweapons. This caused a brief increase in alert levels in all world navies. In the last three months, the steps of the Russian Navy to increase the Battle of the Atlantic have attracted a lot of attention. Also, at the end of January, the Russian frigate Admiral Gorshkov, the first warship, converted to use Zirkin hypersonic cruise missiles, was spotted moving towards the east coast of the United States. The Russian warship crossed half the Atlantic Ocean and was spotted 800 miles from Washington. The action of the Russian Navy did not seem dangerous or unusual. However, it worried Washington that the launch range of Zirkin missiles could reach 2,000 kilometers. Also in January, the sighting of a Russian spy ship off the coast of Hawaii alarmed the U.S. Navy. In the first weeks of January, the U.S. Coast Guard tracked down a Russian vessel believed to be an intelligence-gathering vessel off the coast of the Hawaiian Islands. The U.S. Coast Guard said it was tracking a suspected Russian spy ship off the coast of Hawaii in international waters. As tensions escalated between Washington and Moscow over Russia's war in Ukraine, the U.S. Coast Guard said the situation was not unusual, but was monitoring it closely. The actions of Viktor Lenov, a Russian surveillance ship sailing off the coast of South Carolina and Florida, were determined to be unsafe as it did not use headlights in low visibility weather and did not respond to merchant ships. Attempts to communicate to avoid potential accidents. The U.S. Coast Guard said in a statement that although foreign military vessels may freely pass through the U.S. economic exclusive zone, foreign flagged military vessels have generally been observed to operate and navigate within the response area of Coast Guard District 14, according to customary international law. As a result, the measures taken against Russia's aggression with the increasing tension in the Atlantic continue to threaten the global order with the effects of the Ukraine war. On the other hand, the Arctic has long been a key strategic preparation point for Russia's naval nuclear deterrent capabilities from Soviet times to the present. The primary mission of the Russian Navy remains strategic deterrence provided by the Navy's ballistic missile submarines based on the Northern and Pacific fleets. In this regard, 
an event focusing on how to deter Russia in the Arctic had brought together representatives of the U.S. and Norwegian Armed Forces in Washington, D.C. The roundtable, organized by the Wilson Center's Polar Institute, focused on Russia's increasing prioritization of the Arctic region and how the United States and its partners, particularly Norway, could deter Russian aggression in the region. The commander of the U.S. Second Fleet, Vice Admiral Dan Dwyer, stated that Russia is challenging the stability of the Arctic. In response, Russia issued its new maritime doctrine, which prioritized the Arctic as the most important maritime aspect and promised to protect these waters by all means. This doctrine included increased attention to the Arctic coastline, as well as the introduction of new missile capabilities to focus on the Northern Fleet's stronghold. But Russia, which is causing complete chaos in the Atlantic, is moving in the opposite direction with the doctrine. It has published. So Russia's priorities have recently undergone a shift with the Arctic crossing the Atlantic as Russia's main priority. In this time period, the Russians showed serious examples of aggression. Despite all this Russian aggression or reckless moves towards possible aggression, the U.S. military has declared that Russian activity in the North American Air Defense Identification Zone is occurring regularly and is not seen as a threat. In February, the USA and Russia came face to face in a non-dangerous way. The U.S. intercepted for Russian aircraft after the Alaskan North American Aerospace Defense Command, nor it detected it over Alaska, nor it said on February 13 that it detected, tracked, definitively identified and intercepted for Russian aircraft that entered and operated in the Alaska Defense Identification Zone. As a result, Russian aircraft remained in international airspace and did not enter American or Canadian sovereign airspace. It was also stated that two NORADS F-16 fighters intercepted Russian aircraft, including the Tu-95 Bear H and Su-35 warplanes. NORAD had anticipated this Russian activity and as a result of their planning was prepared to thwart it. So in what direction is the Russian Navy's activities in the world seas progressing and where are they located? The Russian Navy has the most diverse submarine fleets in the world. Moscow considers some of these submarines to be capable of launching ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads as an important component of its strategic deterrence. With an estimated 58 ships, the Russian Navy manages one of the largest submarine fleets in the world. However, these ships can be deployed worldwide, which is a valid reason to alarm U.S. commanders. An alarm was also sounded by U.S. Air Force General Glenn Van Herc, the director of U.S. Northern Command and NORAD. They transported their subs the first to the Pacific, Van Herc told the U.S. Army Conference Association. Another is currently in the Mediterranean and another one is moving towards the Atlantic. A month before Van Herc comment, naval analyst High Sutton had claimed that Russian Navy forces were being reinforced in the Mediterranean. This may be important given the strategic importance of the region in U.S. calculations. In addition, the USA is trying to strengthen its presence in the Mediterranean. In addition, Rear Admiral Michael Studman, commander of the Naval Intelligence Office, highlighted the risk posed by Russia's Severodvinsk as JNS or Yasin class as it is popularly known. There are also Russian submarines in the Pacific and Atlantic. Therefore, it is essential for the United States to follow these submarines and their actions. Nobody wants to accept defeat. It requires great maturity to be able to accept defeat. Those who don't want to accept defeat keep on fighting, or they try to change the rules and cheat. That is what Putin, who suffered a historic defeat against Ukraine, is doing. Russia realized that it could not win this war against the resistance of the Ukrainian army. Putin decided to use an unusual method to change the situation. But Ukrainian soldiers managed to foil this plan. It was like a movie anchor Daily News team learned all the details of this event through Ukrainian soldiers. Thanks to this extraordinary effort of our team, the whole world will learn about the heroism of the Ukrainian army. When Putin realized that the Russian army was not enough to defeat Ukraine, he thought of an interesting method. He ordered to confiscate the clothes of Ukrainian soldiers captured by the Russian army. Russian soldiers put on the clothes of Ukrainian soldiers and were sent to the war zone. The soldiers were first sent to the Russian-occupied Kharkov region. At midnight, they were to secretly cross into the area controlled by the Ukrainian army. They would be sent to Chernihiv Oblast, north of Kiev and bordering Belarus. From this area they would launch an attack on the Belarusian border. This would make Belarus think that Ukraine was attacking it. As a result, 
the Belarusian army would wage war against Ukraine. Putin's plan was quite simple. Similar plans have been implemented. In other words, it is called a false flag operation. Usually states carry out such operations to make themselves look victimized and gain international support. But the false flag operation is nothing but slander. After Putin explained this plan to the Russian commanders, about 100 Russian soldiers were deployed. These soldiers were selected from different battalions. The Russian army assigned the most inexperienced soldiers for this operation because it was thought that these soldiers would be killed by the Belarusian army during the conflict. Putin kept sending soldiers to their deaths. 100 Russian soldiers recruited from 10 different units set off wearing the military uniforms of Ukrainian prisoners. These soldiers were loaded into 520 passenger military vehicles. The soldiers crossed into Ukrainian territory in small groups. Only then Ukrainian soldiers noticed them. However, no one suspected them because the Russian soldiers were dressed in Ukrainian military uniforms. But the soldiers at the Ukrainian Army Observation Tower became suspicious of the increase in the number of troops in the area. They started watching the new arrivals through binoculars. All of these soldiers looked very worried. But the Ukrainian Army had no plans for a new operation in this area. This ghost soldier became more suspicious and continued to observe them. As he looked through the binoculars, he noticed something extraordinary. There was something strange about the uniforms of these soldiers. The Ukrainian flag crest on the sleeve of the military uniforms was upside down. The spotter immediately informed his commanders. The commanders came to the observation towers and started looking through the binoculars. The upside-down flags were a sign the Ukrainian military knew that Russia had carried out false flag operations in many wars. It was thought that Russia could also carry out such an operation in this war. That's why all the soldiers were trained in this. The captured Ukrainian soldiers were told that they had to remove the flags from their uniforms and glue them upside down. And the captured Ukrainian soldiers did just that. This is how the Russian soldiers were exposed, thanks to a very clever strategy. Zelensky's commanders managed to foil Putin's plan, but it was not easy for Ukrainian soldiers. 100 Russian soldiers had arrived at the base and there were only 20 Ukrainian soldiers. Ukrainian soldiers immediately came up with a plan. First of all, they wanted to scatter the Russian soldiers in different areas. Four Ukrainian soldiers prepared their rockets. Six soldiers took over the machine guns. The other 10 soldiers took their weapons and waited for orders for the operation. Ukrainian soldiers first tried to divide the Russian army in two. The soldiers were fired at from two different sides. The soldiers at the machine guns fired from two different directions, splitting the Russian soldiers in two. At this stage, soldiers with rockets came into play. Russian soldiers were targeted with rockets fired one after the other. The Russian soldiers who had suffered great losses realized that they had been exposed. They grabbed their weapons and started to open fire. But guns were useless against the rocket attack. By the time the Ukrainian soldiers ran out of rockets, 56 Russian soldiers had been killed. But there was still more Russian soldiers. But the Russian soldiers were very inexperienced. Ukrainian soldiers continued to fight with great courage. Moreover, strategically, the Ukrainian soldiers were in a more advantageous position. Ukrainian soldiers fired from watchtowers and trenches, but the Russian soldiers were completely unprotected and they had nowhere to run. Ukrainian soldiers used their machine guns very well. After a long battle, 33 more Russian soldiers were killed. The Russian soldiers realized that they could no longer win this battle. They decided to lay down their arms and surrender. 11 Russian soldiers laid down their arms and surrendered. The surrendered Russian soldiers told everything during the interrogation. This is how Putin's false flag operation was exposed. The Ukrainian Northern Operational Command issued a statement on this issue. Ukrainian authorities reported that Russian forces are trying for possible false flag operations in the international border areas of Chernihiv Oblast. The International Institute for the Study of War has also published its latest report on Russia's false flag operations. These reports reveal how desperate Putin is. Putin is furious that this plan is not working. Putin is doing his best to involve Belarus in this war but without success. It is now almost impossible for the Russian army to win this war. All Putin's plans are running out. Zelensky's government has made a very strong preparation against all Putin's plans since the beginning of the war. All of Putin's attack plans have been successfully thwarted. 
Ukrainian intelligence is also working hard to expose Russia's attack plans. As a result of these efforts, it is known that many of Russia's attack plans have been exposed. The Russian military is suffering from a major intelligence failure. Many senior officials in Russia believe that this war must end as soon as possible. That is why some Russian officials are believed to be sharing classified information with the Ukrainian government. Ukrainian intelligence is doing top secret work and intercepting Putin's plans. Putin is going crazy as all his plans are exposed. What do you think about Russia's false flag operation? What else do you think Putin will do to get the Belarusian army to join this war? What do you think about the exposure of Putin's plans? What do you think about the work of Ukrainian intelligence and military? Do you think the Ukrainian military tactics were successful in this operation? There are a lot of updates from the Luhansk region here before the new year. The Ukrainians launched an offensive operation despite the fact that forest battles are slower. The Ukrainians still brought massive results. They advanced by more than two kilometers. They pushed the Russians from their last defense line. And now both parties are preparing for the final battle in Kremena. Last time I told you that the Ukrainians assaulted Russian positions north of Dibrov in the first stage of the operation. The Ukrainians managed to reduce Russian control around Dibrov significantly, but when the fighting got close to the main base, moving forward became much more difficult as the Russians here had more established positions and better supplies. Besides, the only area under Russian control basically remained the forest, so the Ukrainians could not generate rapid breakthroughs here with their mobile units. That is why the fights became positional, engaging only infantry, artillery, and aviation. The deteriorating weather conditions also played a role. The Ukrainians here waited for the drop in temperature to conduct this offensive operation, but it seems like several days in. The temperature rebounded and there was rain followed by several days of above zero temperature. Luckily, the Ukrainian offensive did not suffer as much as it could. The reason why the Ukrainian offensive did not fail is that they managed to push the Russians from the fields. So the Ukrainians used the fields while they could gain some ground and secured their positions along the forest. And after that, the forest battle started where the Ukrainians could not use their cars anyway, regardless of whether it was raining or not. Still, as you can imagine, even in the forest, dry weather is preferable for the offensive operation. That is why the offensive operation has inadvertently slowed down but not stopped. During this humid conditions, both the Ukrainians and the Russians started to rely on artillery and aviation more heavily. According to a Russian source, the Ukrainians have around 1,500 servicemen constantly storming Russian positions. According to Military Land, the Ukrainians have deployed the 45th Artillery Brigade to the spot of operation, which is to a large extent focused on the area of the main action Kremena. Additionally, to provide air support to ground troops, the Ukrainians continue to engage in tactical aircraft Su-27 and MiG-29 from the airfield in northern Ukraine. The Russians seem to have slowly given into the pressure. Ukrainian deputy chief of the main operational directorate reported that Ukrainian forces have advanced 2.5 kilometers in the direction of Kremena over the past week and are continuing offensive actions towards the settlement. Later, a social media post claimed that Ukrainian forces captured Dibrova. There was no official confirmation of the Ukrainians entering this village, so the post was disregarded. However, when several days later Russian Ministry of Defense reported about hunting down Ukrainian artillery around Dibrova, it became obvious that the Russians had left it. This doesn't mean that the Ukrainians have entered it. It looks like it is a gray zone that no party can occupy due to the overwhelming fire. Additionally, a reserve officer and military analyst indirectly confirmed that the Russians left Dibrova by saying that the Ukrainians are operating less than 5 kilometers away from Kremena. Other Russian sources are largely indicating that the battle for Kremena has almost started. A Bar 13 affiliated source claimed that Ukrainian forces are preparing to attack Kremena from three directions. Another Russian source said that they're expecting a Ukrainian counteroffensive operation once the ground freeze is in the area, which is forecasted to drop below zero in two days and stay below zero for more than a month. Some sources also emphasize that the Ukrainians are even preparing the infrastructure to supply and support the stormtroopers by erecting additional pontoon crossings southwest of Kremena. The Russians are trained to adapt to the rapidly worsening situation.
The Ukrainian head of the Luhansk region reported that Russian forces are continuing to transfer more equipment and personnel to the Kremino area, including a substantial number of Wagner Group personnel. However, it seems like they understood that this would not be enough and have reinforced Kremino with their elite airborne forces. Additionally, the Russian Ministry of Defense claimed that Russian forces relocated here and already started using thermobaric artillery systems, which is a high-value military district-level asset. The fact that the Russians are allocating here the best of what they have means that they are very concerned with losing Kremina. And this is not surprising because they had spent a considerable number of resources in order to erect a formidable defense line around Svartov. But if the Ukrainian state Kremina, then they can simply go around it. Kremina is an incredibly valuable town by establishing control over it. The Ukrainians could attack Svadov, Starobilsk, and Lysikansk. But the most important thing is that the Russian logistics will be completely immobilized. There are rear positions will be compromised and the front line can crumble even until the pre-war line of separation.